recording. This will be recorded and you will be able to find it on our the CAD1 YouTube page here probably next week sometime. So we're going to talk about work sharing. What is work sharing? Why are we using work sharing, etc.? Um, biggest thing about that, it's also commonly referred to as work sets. So it's how Revit's going to deal with multiple users working on a single building file. So it might not be new to some of you. Some of you guys might be coming in for best practices. Um, big thing you want to talk about work sharing or setting up work sets, it's not layers or AutoCAD layers. I think the biggest problem that I see when I go to clients' offices is everybody like has 600 work sets on a project. Okay, it's maybe a slight exaggeration, but I'll go see 20 or 30 work sets on a project, and it's kind of like, um, really don't need that many work sets. I think a lot of people consider them um, kind of like AutoCAD layering. Now, if you are watching this and you're stuck back in the Revit, you know, like 7 world before we had element borrowing, which I think came out in 9 or 9.1, um, then yeah, you might need to have a lot more work sets. But if you're still in the Revit 7 environment, yeah, I feel sorry for you and work sets are the least of your worries. So once Revit came out with element borrowing, it's really not a need to have a whole bunch of those. So I see a lot of people use them as layers. And the other thing is what work sharing is not, it's not visibility graphics. I think one of the big confusions as people start getting into work sharing too, is really what is it and how does it work and what's going on there? Since Windows only allows a single user to access a file, Autodesk came out with work sharing, or the Revit engineers, I should say, came out with work sharing. So this is how we actually enable more than one user to work on a file at a time. So when you're starting to look at this and you get into it, what's going to happen is there's going to be the central model, which is what's going to happen when we create the work sharing or work sets in a project. And once that's been set up, every user is going to be copying that file from the, the server down onto their local machine. And there's multiple ways you can do that. And then you work on your local machine, and that local machine is going to be communicating with the central model. So you can go back up, hey, I, I need to go work on this piece of the model. Can I have that piece of the model? The model says, yeah, you can have that piece, and it checks it out to it. So that's also something else I think that a lot of people don't understand, is there is a ton of communication happening between your, your um, computer and the server. So it's really why work sharing doesn't work fabulous over um, a WAN. It's definitely looking for more of a local area network, not a wide area network. So all going to be dependent, the speed is going to be dependent on the communication you have from your machine to where that central file resides. So I was with one client a few years ago, and they had this beautiful old historic building, and they didn't want to ruin it with cables, so everybody was using a wireless network. And that wireless network was only a 100 meg network, and it was tremendously slow for them to do any work. So they had to go through and, you know, get some cabling in order to actually be able to work um, in the Revit environment. Because like I said, every time you pick on something, it's basically com your file communicating to the central file, can I do this? And it's as you pan, well, not necessarily pan, but it's as you click on an element. As you go to properties, you try to change the, the hidden lines or anything like that, there's constant communication happening back and forth. And, Brian, the question on everyone's lips, or certainly Jason's lips, are you, Are we going to talk about Revit Server in relation to to a work-sharing project? Revit Server is a beast unto itself. Um, but, uh, I wasn't going to, but we can, we can talk about Revit Server in that scenario, because really the only difference is, and I should have put a, put a model on here, is if you are going to be working over a WAN, so, you know, maybe you've got multiple offices. You've got an office in Denver, and you've got an office in Chicago. Well, you got people in both offices wanting to work on the same. So part of what you get with Autodesk is the capability to download Revit Server and install Revit Server. And how that ends up happening is each office will have, I like to call them a local server. So what's happening is, is I'm doing a synchronize and I'm doing a save. My computer is talking to the server in my office. Then behind the scenes, the server in my office talks to the server over in Chicago or Detroit or wherever I said. So it's going to talk to that server over on the other side of the world. So I'm not waiting for my machine to communicate to that server over there. My machine's just communicating back and forth to my file or to my local server, and that server is communicating behind the scenes. There's a lot of setup for Revit Server on the IT side of things, but once the IT has all that set up, it's pretty seamless for a local user to go in and do it. The only difference is, is the open and where you browse for the file. So I will try to remember to show that. So if I forget, Jason, feel free to peg us with another question. But that's really the only difference is Revit server is behind the scenes taking care of the two central models talking to each other.
Yeah, and I, do, I don't think we'll get, or I know we won't get into depth in Revit Server today, although I think that would be a good webinar topic, but it, it branches out so quickly into the IT area of the company, and it's, it's well, is the problem we're having IT related, or is it Revit related? And that, that can get sticky for people pretty quickly. And one of my clients just set it up, and it was they, they, they had me sit down with them and come up with, okay, we needed a description of how us as the end users are going to need it. And it was about a 10-minute conversation. I showed them where the open icon is. I kind of explained what happens behind the scene. And they were all, oh, that's it? It's like, yeah, that's pretty much it. So they were thinking it was going to be a lot more involved than it is for the end user, and it's really not. Yeah. I will say this. There are a couple nuances when you're using Revit Server. With Revit Server, on the server, you can only link Revit files from the Revit server. So if you're linking in AutoCAD files, it does become a little bit weird and glitchy because if I have my own server in the Denver office and the Chicago office has their own server, and we're not talking Revit server, we're talking normal servers, um, what's going to happen is I'm going to say, hey, let's go link this AutoCAD file. Well, I can't link an AutoCAD file from the Revit server. I've got to do it from my project server. And so once I do it from my normal data server, I'm going to be able to link it, but then the Chicago office doesn't get to see that. So when you start talking um, keynoting and linking in DWG files, there is kind of some weird workarounds that you have to do to get that to work. But Anyway, that said, let's get you back on track with the uh, so that's, work share. So that's really how Revit are using uh, central file work sharing works. I almost said Revit server there. <coughs> so we're going to talk about how to create the central model, what, what are the steps involved in the central model, and then we're going to get into best practices for it. So how do we set them up? How do you create local copies onto your C drive? There's a couple different ways. Um, what are some of the features you get once you do that? Opening and closing work set, the work set display tool. And then also how do you go ahead and take that building and remove its relationship to the – create your own file that's got no relationship? And I think that's a big one I like to talk about too because so many often times I go into a project – and somebody copies a file over to another folder, and they start working, not understanding their updated original. So we're going to go ahead and jump into that, and we'll jump right over to Revit. So one question I get asked a lot is, when do you set up work sharing? When do I need to enable work sets? And the question is, or the answer to that is, whenever you feel like it. The only time it's mandatory you set it up is once someone else needs to be on the project. So if you're going to work on the project by yourself during SD and DD and you're, no one's going to get on it until you get to CDs, you can enable work sharing once you get to CDs. It just depends when that's going to happen and, and when you need to do it. So really the only time that you have to do it is when the person is going to be working on the file. I have a lot of clients who they don't actually use a Revit project or use a Revit template. They have a Revit project, so the work set's already enabled. And it's going from day one, so it just depends on what your your option of that is. But the only correct answer to that is is one. There's going to be more than one person. If you want to do it from day one, go for it. If you want to do it right before somebody gets on it, that works just as well. So this file here is a single user file, and one of the ways I can tell it's a single user file is because if I come down here on my status bar and I look towards the bottom, there is only this is your work sets. Um, little quick button down here, and there's nothing, no text in that view. If there's no text in there, that means there's no work set set up. You could also go to the Collaborate tab and do see the same thing, too, that on work sets. Oh, this is weird. It is saying there's a work set in here, but there's no work set, so that's kind of weird. I don't know what's going on here. I think I got some sort of issue going on here. So there's no, shouldn't be any work sets going on right there either. The other reason I can tell there's this is not a work set um, enabled file is on my quick access toolbar here, I have this little shortcut that says um, synchronize and modify settings. If that is grayed out, that lets you know you're also in a single user file. So once you see that you're in that, you're either in a detached copy or you're in a single user file. So that's how I can tell this is a single user file, there's nothing going on. So enable to, or in order to enable work sharing, the first thing you have to do is click on the work sets button. So again, you can either click on the work sets button right there, or you can come down here and click on the work sets button down in the bottom of your status bar. Both of those are going to activate the same dialog. That dialog box that's going to come up is going to say you are about to enable work sharing. Careful planning and consideration, yeah, you can kind of pretty much ignore this dialog box. 
what it's basically telling you is I'm going to take all of the 3D modeled elements and put them on a work set called work set one, and I'm going to take datum elements, levels, and grids, and put those on to the levels and grids. Now, I have one little tip I always like to talk about here. The one thing for me is I will always put an underscore in front of my main work set. So if you want to rename your work set main work set or Bob or Fred or Barney, I don't care. But what I always do in the main work set, I put it on an underscore in front of it. And the reason why I do this is when you create a new local file for the first time, it looks through the alphabetic, the last, the first alphabetical work set and makes that your work set. And S does come before W. So a lot of times I see clients have half the stuff modeled on the levels and grids work set, and everybody's like, why, is, why do you keep doing that? And, and it's partially just because of the name. I am also a little bit OCD. I don't understand why it's called shared levels and grids. Maybe it's because levels and grids are sharing the work set, but I don't think I need the word shared in there, so I just delete it. That's just a Brianism. There's no big deal about that. And like I said, these can be any name you want them to be. You can have them set up however you want. I just like to say levels and grids and underscore work sets. That's my personal preference. So I'm going to say OK to that dialog box. And technically, it's enabling the work sharing right now. But if I decided and I changed my mind, no, 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 I don't want to do this, I could close the file without saving, and it's not going to be done. So this doesn't, take in a, uh, this doesn't go into effect until you hit the Save button. Brian, one note on your OCD there. Um, I think there's a lot of good foundation under it, though, because you know it and we know it here at CAD 1 as well, that you go to a lot of firms and you see one guy, say, shared files, and another guy not say it, and another guy say something else entirely. And this is where, if you're going to be working with work sets and you're going to be doing this, you really should set up a a standard dialogue throughout the company for what you call things, how you do it, so forth and so on. And it gets overlooked more than you'd like to care to think about. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, that is one of the big things when you get into there is, you know, and that's why a lot of my clients do start, instead of with a Revit template, they start with a Revit project that already has work sharing enabled. So that way everybody's creating the same work set. Somebody's not calling it Yep. Revit links, and the other guy is calling it linked Revit files. It's all going to have the, the same consistency of name. And the other kind of big thing on that, too, is if there are certain things you are using work sets for, you can include those in a, a view template. So if you're not using a project template, but you're using a Revit project that had work sharing enabled, you can preset some of those things in view templates as you get into them. So it just depends, like I said, on the flavor your company wants to choose. So once it gets done processing all that information, it's going to open up your work sets dialog box. And it's going to show you that in this work sets dialog box, here's the two work sets that were created. And right now, whoever created that file owns those work sets. And we'll get more into this in a little bit. If you wanted to, you could add more work sets right now, or you can come back and later and add work sets as you see fit. I don't usually do a whole lot of work sets um, in a project. But one of the things that I do sometimes do for work sets, um, a lot of times I will create a work set for Revit links and also for um, CAD links or yeah, CAD based links. So for me, I might right at this point in time start a Revit links work set and a CAD links work set if I'm going to get into there. I don't usually create a whole lot of modeling work sets, but some people do, and there are reasons why I would create modeling work sets, too, and we'll get into those in a little bit. So I'm just going to create one work set now. I'm going to say Links Revit, and I'm going to say OK to this dialog box. And it's saying, do you want to make the new work set you just created the active work set? So as I start modeling, do I want that to be the one that everything's getting modeled to? I'm going to say no to that. I still want my active work set to be the default work set of underscore work set. Okay? Brian, Jason makes a comment before we get too far away from the subject. Uh, the process of creating a project would change if a project starts from a project instead of a template. And then his firm currently uses the template method. Um, the only thing that would really change is instead of saying file new and you go browse to a project template, you would open the central template, the simple project, the template project file, if I want to call it that, and you would detach and do a save as. That's really going to be the only difference between the two. Um, other than that, it's very similar in what's happening. 
So once I get this done and I have this information set up, now it's just a matter of going in and saying, okay, I've now just enabled work sets. Now, since I did this and I had the file on the server, or maybe this file was on my local C drive or whatever is happening, I'm not going to hit the save button because it will overwrite that single user file. Maybe that's what you want at your office. But I'm going to go in and do a save as because I need to move this to a different location. I had just been modeling this on my C drive or maybe I was modeling it in some other folder. I need to now change possibly the naming of it as well as the fact that I want to go in and put this in a, in a different location. So if you do save, it overwrites the file you had. If you do save as, now you can save it anywhere you want while making it that central file. So I'm going to go do a save as as a project. And we're going to go to my D drive. And I think I have a folder. I might have deleted it recently. Um, I did delete it recently. So I'm going to come up here and I'm just going to create a new folder. And I'm going to call this new folder my server. So it's probably just down here under new folder. Yep. I'm going to rename this new folder. And we're going to pretend this is my server. All right, so I'm going to go up to my server. I'm going to find my project folder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's different from everybody. And I'm just going to come in here and give this um, a name. I always like to put an A in front of it, and I like to put um, what year of Revit's being used on this. That way, if somebody's going in to open this project, they don't have to sit there and say, man, was this done in Revit 13, 14, 15, 16? What release of Revit is this inside of here? So I'm going to give it a project name. I like to put like an A14 or an A2014. I usually just do A14. So I understand that this is using Revit, and it's the architectural model doing 14. So it's Revit architecture or the architectural model using 2014. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do a save. It's now posting all that information and getting all that data set. So now what's happened in the model is if I go back to a 3D view, everything that I've modeled has now been placed on a work set. So there's, there's now this new property over here for each, each modeled object, and it's saying, hey, this is going to be on work set one. So it took everything that I modeled it, put it on work set one. But I already had some Revit files linked in here, and I wanted to put those Revit files onto the Revit links work set. So what I need to do is now start selecting these files and telling them in their properties, I need to be on the linked Revit work set. And I just like to do this because you can turn links off, you can turn them on. Um, the reason I really like to do this is I can open it without the links work set, and we'll talk about that just here in a minute. But so I need to go grab this and say, hey, I want to put that on the links work set. You know, now I'm going to find my structural model, which I believe is linked inside of here. Maybe I can't get to it because it's visible spin around here. Oh, it's, the whole foundation is structural. So we'll grab this file and say, okay, yes, this one is also going to be part <coughs> excuse me, of my Lynx Revit work set. Now, one thing I do want to show here that a lot of people don't know is linked models have a type property as well as an instance-based property for work sets. And I always get asked the question a lot, if people do notice this, why is there both? So let's say you were putting this building on a campus and you had a site file. Well, the site file could be building architecture, and then each one of the individual buildings could be on its own work set as well. So if I wanted to control it globally via the work set, I could check out the building work set. But then I could have A, B, and C for each time it's been copied. So if you also notice, you hit edit type on any linked file, there's another work set under the type properties. In this case, I'm not going to have different work sets. I want to go into both of those files hit the edit type, so I'm changing not only the instance-based work set, but as well as the type-based work set. So now I've just taken that and I've moved it to another work set for um, my Lynx work set. All right. Now at this point in time, I'm still in the central file. I own everything in the model. If somebody else tries to go work, it's going to tell them they can't because I own everything. And if I go back to the work sets dialog box, you're going to see that right now, again, I'm still the owner of everything. And what that means is I own every modeled objects in the file. So if somebody were else to go start creating a local file and working, I'm going to own everything, and they're not going to be able to do a whole lot of, a lot of working inside of there. So what I need to do is now go up here and do a, go ahead and do a synchronize with central. 
So I'm still in the central file, so I'm going to synchronize it with itself, so it's kind of confusing, but I'm going to go ahead and synchronize this file to the central. And I want to make sure that whenever this dialog box comes up when doing synchronize, I'm telling Revit I want to give up my rights to anything that might be here. So if I don't check this user created work sets and Stan decides to go start creating a local file and work, he's not going to be able to do a whole lot because I own everything. And, and I'm I, prone to do that at times. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I want to make sure that once I create the central file, I'm always going in and saying, you know, I'm going to synchronize it. I'm going to give up all my rights to everything. So if any of these elements had been being able to be checked, I would be checking them and saying, okay. So what I've done is I've enabled work sharing slash work sets. I've created one or two work sets that I feel I needed, and then I'm going to synchronize it, giving up all my rights, and now I'm going to close out of this. So if I go back over here and start looking at my little Windows Explorer and go to my fake server here, there is my Revit file. Now what you're also going to notice that happens once you create this Revit file is it's automatically going to create this little temp folder for you and going to do a backup folder. So single user files all have the .001002 and those are your backup files for a single user as well as families. Um, that's backup for your single user files. But in the Revit server site, not Revit server, excuse me, in the um, work shared or a central file, it creates a folder, and that folder has databases built into them. And all of those little databases is what ends up creating a backup file. So there's a lot of things going on with different um, pieces inside of there, but you'll see that once you create that, you'll have a backup folder automatically generated. And Revan understands that when you're getting into this, um, it understands all your eggs are in one basket, so it's really going to try to start backing this file up for you in multiple locations. Brian Clint asks, uh, while we're here, he says, uh, user-created work sets are grayed out on his uh, computer or his Revit, but I can select borrowed elements. Yep, and that's because when you're borrowing elements, you're not checking out the entire work set. Usually the only time you'll have the entire work set checked out is when you originally create the file. If you're coming into it later, very rarely does anybody go in and grab the entire work set for that to happen. So that's probably why if you don't have an entire work set checked out, you've only been going through and grabbing it on an element by element basis. And we'll get there in just one second. Okay, so now that I've got this file created, I need to go generate a local file. And there are two ways you can generate a local file when you're doing this. Um, I have clients do it both ways. It depends on how you want to see it and what's going on with you. So I've got my server up there, and then on my C drive, I have a folder called Revit Local Files. And as you can see, I have a tremendous amount of local files on here because every client I go to, I've got to create a local file when I'm helping them work. So on my C drive, I always create a, um, a folder called Local Files, Revit Local Files, whatever you want to call it. And I make sure everybody in the office has that exact same folder. Because it's, if you're trying to do any sort of scripting or batch routines, it's going to be huge if they can be in the same folder. So I have everybody create a little folder directly on their C drive called Revit Local Files. Now, one way to create a local copy is to simply grab the central file and copy it to another folder. This other folder could be on your C drive. It could be on an, you know, on an uh, external hard drive. It could be somewhere else on the server. Really, you want to keep it on your C drive, but it could reside anywhere that you needed it to reside. So now I've got this BH Office is A14. If I manually copy it, I always suggest to people that you then rename it and put in like your initials. So give it a name, give it your initials, something like that. So you know this is your local file. One of my clients even then says, hey, this is so-and-so's local. So it's, the, it's my BD Mackey Consulting local file. Okay. That's entirely up to you how you want to do that. Oop, that's not what I meant to do. Let's try to do that again. I did not mean to do that. I apologize. So I've got my BDM Office 14. So now to open that one, I would just simply come down here into, the Rev, into my Revit, hit open, go to my local files, and go find that file. 
you'll now notice you've got something um, different going on in the open dialog box. My open dialog box now has this detach from central, create local, and this always has the audit button. But right now, I can tell this is a local file because the create new local is grayed out. It's not going to let you create a local from a local. So when you're opening up a file, if you pay attention to these buttons down here, you're going to be able to tell, am I trying, am I about picking on a local file or am I picking on a central file? And I'll show you how to tell the difference. So right now, since create local is grayed out, this is either a single user file or a local file. And I know it's not a single user file because it has detached from central. So I know I am right now going to be opening up a local file. So I'll go ahead and hit open. If you're opening up a local file for the first time, it's, it's letting you know, hey, you're opening up a local file. This file has been copied or moved, so therefore it's going to be local. I paraphrased, obviously, but so now I have a local file. So I'm not in the central file, I'm, I'm in my local file. And you'll get that every time you open up a local file for the first time. Okay. So again, it looks pretty similar. There's not a whole lot going on here. I've got my local file created, and here we go. Here's everything in the model. i got my coordination views. This just basically means I'm working locally. Now, if you're ever worried, well, I don't know if I opened up the local. I forgot what I did this morning. It's three hours later. I again can tell now I'm not in the central file because not only do I have the save icon up here, I have the synchronize icon on my quick access toolbar. So once I see save and synchronize, that lets me know I am in a local file. I can either synchronize it to the server or save it locally to my C drive. So that's another little nuance or a little hint there to see, hey, what's going on and how are we doing this? Okay, so now you've got your local file. You can go about your ordinary day starting to work and do what you wanted to do. I'm going to go ahead and open up another session of Revit. I should have actually, you know, logged into Stan's machine, and we could have switched presenters back and forth. But I guess that's okay because Revit's probably not installed on that machine. Yeah, but it would have been fun. <laughs> so I'm gonna open up another session of Revit, and this will probably take some time. My Revit 14 takes a while to open. Um, so what you're gonna see is now that I'm gonna go in here and start working, I'm gonna create a new local file called User2, and I'm gonna go ahead and do it as User2. The one thing that I'm going to do inside of here. Before I do that, though, is I've got to give myself a different name. Because if I try to open Revit local files with two of the computers that has the same one, then when I get into there, it's not going to understand it's two separate people because it's honestly just using the username on this. So I'm going to call this user2. All right. So the other way to generate a local file is to not copy it to the C drive like you saw me do. Another way to go ahead and do this is to just simply go hit open. Go browse to the server where you have um, your normal project folders. So I'm going to go in there. I have this under server. And here's the BHM office. Notice the difference. Create new local isn't grayed out. It's automatically checked. It's saying, hey, you have now picked on a central file, and you're gonna, I'm going to automatically generate a local file for you. So in years past, I used to do the copy from clipboard, paste it in, rename it. But nowadays, I don't do that. I just browse to the one on the server, make sure create new local is checked, hit open. And what that's going to do is automatically go to my um, Revit local files and create a new BHM office with whatever my username is. So it does the renaming for me automatically. Ryan, uh, speaking of little messages at the bottom, RJ asks, why does the work set one say not editable at the bottom of the screen? It means you don't own the work set. So it's kind of confusing. It should say not checked out or not owned or something. But we'll talk, well, I'll get to that in just, just a little bit as we start talking a little more. But that's what that means for you is you don't own the entire work set. Okay, so now you can see I'm user two over here and I'm, I'm, I'm myself on the left. So I've got my alter ego going on on the right, and then you know my actual ego over here on the, on the left. So what you're going to see is if I take an object and start manipulating it, so let's just say I want to take this wall, and I wanted that wall to be 20 feet apart. So I'm going to take that wall and move it over 20 feet. Right? So user 2 just took that wall. And then I'm over here, user 1, and my crazy boss and Stan told both of me to manipulate the same part of the model. So once I come over here as the other user, 
and I go to move this wall to be 20 feet, I'm going to get this big warning that pops up. And it's going to say, hey, by the way, you can't edit that element because user 2 owns it. So Revit's automatically coming here and saying, hey, I'm taking control of this. I'm not going to allow the same people to modify the same object. So I can say I want to place a request to my alter ego that I need to actually have that object and get into it. And now my alter ego over here gets this little thing saying, all right, no, it's still the same thing over here. So now we'll cancel. We'll click in Revit over here. And it doesn't always work that well um, when you're trying to do this on the same machine. But usually there would be a pop-up that pops up over here saying, hey, somebody needs you to give up your rights to that object. Okay? So once somebody tells me that, and there's my editing request. And yeah, it's pretty funny. It took that long when I'm on the same machine. Um, so there's my editing request saying, hey, by the way, somebody really, really, really wants to take control over something. And if I just hover over this, this warning, it even tells me what they want to take control of. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm okay with somebody else having that wall. So I'll go ahead and say, uh, close, go ahead and say synchronize. So in order to, have to give my rights to that, it even tells me I need to synchronize the central. So I'm going to go synchronize the central. I'm going to make sure I'm giving up the borrowed elements I have. Notice I don't have user-created work sets because I didn't check out an entire work set. I just have a work set borrowed. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And once it gets done saving, my little editing request goes away. And then theoretically, this person's editing request should come up saying, hey, you've been granted to have that object. However, your model's outdated. You need to go ahead and reload information from the server to see what's changed on that. So I've got this whole nice communication back and forth if you actually read it. Most people don't ever read these. So, so now it's telling me I don't even have to do a synchronize. Most people say, oh, you've got to synchronize. This button will either tell me a synchronize is required or a reload is required. I haven't changed anything in my model, so I don't need to synchronize it. I just need to bring down the data. So what a synchronize is telling you is I'm taking data you've changed, putting it up there, and bringing data back down to yourself. So I just don't even need to do a synchronize. I can just come up and say, hey, on the Collaborate tab, I just need to reload. And then once I do the reload, and it gets done bringing that data back down, it will fatal error out Revit, because I have two of them open. And <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it did not like me doing that. Note, note to selves, next time load second machine. Next time load, uh, I've done that before. I don't know, could be the fact that this file's been upgraded since like Revit 10 and keeps going through and using this. So, so you're kind of getting the process of what's going on, how that's working, what, what all the information is going there. So as we start talking about this, you guys will work. It sounds really confusing. Honestly, it's not. If this is your first time using um, work sharing, not a big deal. You'll get in. You'll start using it. It will make complete sense to you. More what I want to talk about now is what are best practices? What work sets do you need to get created, et cetera? So I'm going to go into the work sets dialog box again. And so many times I see people create work sets for, like, furniture. I don't understand why there's a work sets for furniture when there's a category for furniture that you can just turn off. I think a lot of people start taking into consideration that it's AutoCAD layers. Now, I do understand having an interiors work set and an exteriors work set. So everything on the interior, I usually don't say interior and exterior. I usually say core and shell and interiors. But um, I understand why you would, would do that. And part of the reason for that is when you're creating a work set, or you have a work set generated, you have the capability to say, don't show this work set in all views. I don't need to always see this work set turned on. And that's partially why I do a links Revit. I like to see the Revit links, but I get so sick and tired of every time I go to a floor plan, all of the linked files are turned on. Every time I go to a 3D view or a section, every time I do anything, I see all of that information. So I can uncheck visible in all views, and then in the views I want to see the length models, I can go tell the work set to be turned back on. So this is a nice feature of being able to have the visible in all views unchecked, so it's not on by default. So that's one reason why you might generate a work set for things like linked Revit's, or the one that really drives me crazy is linked AutoCAD files. Go in and people link AutoCAD files not to current view, but to all views. And so on 3D view, I see 50 AutoCAD files. And in sections, I see 50 AutoCAD files. So that, that visible in all views becomes really, really um, um, nice for things like that. The other reason you might want to go create a new work set 
is because that object could possibly be very large in calculation and, and calculations for Revit, for rendering, for not only rendering, but for just spinning the model, thinking about it. So one work set that I will create for modeled elements a lot of times is going to be vertical circulation. So when I get into vertical circulation, I really like to be able to do that because I'm going to show you a feature that you can tell Revit to not open a work set at the beginning of a project. And therefore, if it doesn't open that work set, it doesn't have to display it. It doesn't have to concentrate on that work, all the objects on that work set that often. So I'm going to go create one called vertical circulation and say, okay. So now with that said, I'm going to go start thinking about, well, what should be on the vertical circulation view or work set? So I'm going to come over here to my first floor view. And this is not the greatest example because it's a small project. But, you know, I'm going to want all handrails and stairs to be on that vertical circulation work set. So I'm going to grab some handrails. I'm going to grab some stairs. I'm going to go back to my 3D view. And I'm going to, with my sunglasses, isolate all handrails and stairs. Because I want all the handrails and stairs in the corridors to be on that vertical circulation work set. I'm going to spin my model to make it easier to select this stuff. And I'm going to grab all of these handrails and doors, or excuse me, stairs, and all of these handrails and stairs. And now I'm going to go to their work set and say, hey, you want to be on the vertical circulation. So I think this is one of those things that a lot of people, once they enable work sharing and they start manipulating the objects to be it, I don't see a lot of people going to 3D views and selecting objects and isolating objects to do it. It's one thing that I always go through and do. So for me, those, work, those stairs, those handrails are all now on the vertical circulation work set. To probably go back to my floor plan, grab my elevator, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm not going to bore you guys with watching me change work sets. So now that that's done, I want to go ahead and synchronize my file. And notice I have user created work sets again because I just created a new work set. I'm going to uncheck that as well and say OK. And the reason or the times I would really use something like this, not on this file, this file is a terrible example. Um, but I might be on a, on a building that's a six or seven story building and it might have three or four stair towers or it's a four story building with three or four stair towers. Think about what's involved in a stair. Revit has to calculate every single bolster, every single handrail, every single bracket, if you have brackets like here on the wall, every riser, every tread, every nosing, every string, all of that stuff Revit is regenerating every time you do something. And most of the time, I don't need to see the stairs. I don't need Revit to think about those. So as I pan, zoom, move around, Revit doesn't need to think about that stuff, at least in my mind. So I've synchronized that, and I want to show you the real reason why I did that and create a vertical circulation. I'm going to go ahead and hit open. I'm going to go ahead and choose to open up the um, Office 14 again. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify what work sets I want to open during this process. So I have the specify button. I want to specify the work set. So once I go ahead and click open, it's going to bring up the work sets dialog box before I even get started. Boom, work sets. Here you go. Here's what's there. I can now choose the vertical circulation, and I can tell Revit to close that or not even open that work set as I turn this on. Now, I can turn it on at any point in time, but I don't want Revit to process or think about that information. So I'm going to say go ahead and close it. Now I'm going to say open, and since I've already had a local file and I'm generating a new local file, Revit's going to ask me, do I want to overwrite the one that's there? So personally for me, I generate a new local file every morning, making sure that at the end of the day you synchronized and you didn't just hit save, because otherwise you'll lose anything you changed. But I'm going to tell it to go ahead and overwrite that existing file. And I'm going to go back to a floor plan or a 3D view, and you're going to notice that none of the stairs are being displayed. So it's kind of weird. You go to floor plan, you're not seeing the stairs. You go, oh, where's my stairs? A lot of people then go to visibility graphics, like, stairs are turned on. Why can't I find stairs? Um, just the work sets off. So as you start thinking about that, now when I'm in the 3D view and I'm spinning the model around, Revit's not processing that stair information. Revit's not going through and doing processing any of that data. If I end up with a project that has a very large um, curtain wall system and there's a lot of mullions and panels, 
and I'm the guy doing the interiors, a lot of times I'll do uh, a shell or a curtain system so I can tell Revit to not open that information and process it. There might be other parts that I want don't want in there as well. So that's sometimes where I'll get into work sharing for kind of AutoCAD layering or for just visibility purposes is not to turn the curtain walls off. It's not to turn stairs and handrails off. I can do that in VG, but I can have Revit have that off in all of these views as I go to work. And if I say close it when opening, I have definitely noticed a speed improvement on larger projects doing that. So vertical circulation is one of my go-to work sets. And uh, for me, when I go to clients and I set that up and I'm helping them out troubleshoot something, I go ahead and open up that project and I don't turn on the vertical circulation. I, I close that right away. And I have definitely noticed a speed improvement when panning, zooming, and doing multiple things in building elevations, in 3D views. It, it's a huge improvement. And on a similar note, RJ has a, a question, kind of question slash comment. Uh, in a similar fashion, it might be good to have a site work set uh, for more complex sloped uh, site work at the building parameters to save memory and speed. Um, for me, site is always a linked file. I always do all my topography in another file because a lot of times I get into topography, it's more than just topography. It's getting into site stuff, you know, trees, shrubs, possibly sidewalks. So for me, site is 99% of the time it's separate file I link in so I can just choose not to load the link. But yeah, if you do have your topography, your topography and things like that, and you want it all in the same file, possibly creating a site work set would work well for you as well. I just usually turn all the topography off and all views by default, um, but you could create that for it as well, absolutely. And then Angelo asks, uh, but if we receive a new Revit file weekly, then we would have to redo those work sets every time we receive an update, correct? Um, no, because I'm working in my own file, and these work sets are part of my own file. They're not part of my linked file. So I don't, I don't think I understand the question, because, no, you're in your own file working, so you just keep the work sets the way you want. And unless you were talking about changing the work set for the linked models, once I've done that, then I don't have to worry about it, because those models are on that work set, and they will stay on that work set as I keep continuing to update the linked files. So hopefully, Angelo, that, that answers the question. If, if you need a little clarification or any of you need some clarification on that, let us know. So one of the other tools that I really, really love, and I don't think a lot of people know about this tool. I think this was introduced in 2012. It might have been 13. But I think it was 12. There's this button down on your view control bar, and it's called the work sharing display. And there's a few different options you have on work sharing display. And this one, to me, is huge. Um, one of the things you can go to do is say, hey, who owns stuff? Right? So once I click on who owns stuff, if somebody owns something in the model, it highlights it to what color somebody else is. So I don't even have to try to pick this object and try to work on it. Since my file crashed on the other thing, I still own it as the other user. But... I don't have to pick on these objects to see if I have rights to them. I can just see somebody else already has rights to that, knowing I can't use that wall. So it's one of the features I love that I see very rarely people are using is the, is the work sharing display. One of the tools I also like is um, work sets. What's on what work set? So I should probably go back and turn on the work set for stairs. But you can see I know here everything's on the correct work set. But let's say I wasn't paying attention and my current work set was levels and grids. And I then go to model a new wall. You're going to see that this new wall is automatically a different color, letting me know what work set I'm on. So this little work sets or work sharing display, um, and then using work sets, you can see what's on what work set, what's not. Old releases, I used to go through and create all these crazy filters to do this in a view, and this was just automatic. If I realize that's on the wrong work set, and I go ahead and change it to be not levels and grids, but work set one, boom, color changes, I'm done, I know I fixed it. So it's that quick and easy to go through and start changing this information. The other thing I love about it is when you hover over an element, you get a really cool tool tip. No longer do you get that person saying, oh, it wasn't me who modified that last, I didn't put that in the wrong location. Right here it tells me the person who created it and the last person who updated it and who currently owns it. 
So right here, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm going to date myself here, but the old family circus icon of the not me ghost that used to run around because <laughs> all the kids would say, not me, not me. Yeah, we can now prove these people wrong. Oh, no, user two, you updated this last. <laughs> I wish it would actually show um, the updates of deleted objects. I wish somehow I could show deleted objects and say, oh, look, you deleted the object, but there's no object to display, so it doesn't work. And then the, the one of the other options you have on here is checkout, not checkout stats. Yeah, so is, are any objects checked out by somebody? If so, who has them? And that's kind of the same thing in my mind as um, owners. So checkout status and owners are pretty much the same thing in my mind. Um, but you also have model updates. So has anything on the model changed since I was last in here? That's a nice little tool um, that you have as well. And Adam yelled out the question, any way to get that uh, hover info on a schedule? Um, not to my object, because there is, you don't have in a schedule the view control bar to say I want the work sharing display. I would love it if you did, but I haven't ever seen it in there, so maybe there's something I don't know about. But Because that's all controlled by your view control bar. So unfortunately, I haven't found a way to get in there. And there's also settings for this. So if you really don't like the color that's associated to you or you don't like the colors that are in there, um, I know I have one, uh, quite a few clients who um, are colorblind. So when things highlight red, it's hard for them to see they're kind of highlighting. So they do come through here and adjust them. Also for me, I always like to be purple. So I like to go in and change my color to be purple on projects. I don't know why. I just do. So I do that. So yeah, you have complete control over the colors out of all the different things you're doing in there. You could also choose to turn colors off. Hey, I don't want vertical circulation to even display with a color when somebody says what work set is it on. So nice little features you have in there to play with too. And Eric asks if those options, uh, and it was before you were talking about colors, if those options are only available in 2014. No, I believe this was in, I know it was in 13, and I believe it was in 2012 as well. I think it was new to 2012, but I know it's in 13. It might even have been all the way back to 11, but I think it was 12. Okay, so I think those are huge features. I use this stuff a lot. When I go in and people start saying, hey, will you check out our model, how we're doing? First thing I do is open up a 3D view. I go to my work sharing display. I hit work sets, and I can go in right away and say, well, you modeled about 80% of the building on shared levels and grids. Brian, uh, Eric, a kind of follow-up question. Erica asks, uh, she said or says she doesn't see those uh, that icon at the bottom of her 13 screen. Um, is it? Perhaps somewhere else, does she need to turn it on? Um, if you're in a single user file, not a, not a work shared ah, file, you, you won't go. get that. Or if you're in a family, you won't get that. You only get it on work shared files. And I also think, yeah, I also think Jason just said, I was just going to say that, Jason. It's got a different look in 13, and I believe it's in a different location because there's a whole bunch of new tools in 14 that we have. So I believe it's in a different location and has a different look in 2013. I'll fire up 13 as we're talking so, so we can look at it. Good luck with that, Erica. <laughs> it looks different, and nobody really knows where it is. <laughs> no, it's still down there. Yeah, Jason uh, says he's in it now, and it has two cubes and a red X at the end of it, and it's in the end icon. Okay. So they printed it up for 14. So those are just some of the features I always like to talk about when you can go through the opening, the closing. Now... Some of those features I did show you, the opening, the closing, et cetera, um, I've opened, you know, I chose that stair work set not to turn on so there's no stairs. But if all of a sudden you need to start working on stairs today, well, it's not a big deal. You can just go back to your work set, the dialog box, choose on that work set, and say, open, yeah, I want to open this work set. So I can choose a previously closed work set, hit OK, and now the stairs are going to be back. So I always start off by not opening up work sets I don't think I'm going to need on large projects. On a project this small, I'd leave everything open. Um, and then I start going through and saying, okay, I got this, I got this, et cetera, and, and then I'll start opening them on an as-needed basis. So that's one thing to do. You can always start off with it closed and choose to open it at any point in time. The other thing about that is you can also go back to the um, work sets dialog box, and you can go back and close it. But I have honestly not found any speed improvement in closing it after it's already been opened as opposed to closing it before I open up the project. It's almost like once it's been loaded into your memory, it's all there and it still slows Revit down. But if you can do it beforehand, it doesn't load it into your memory. 
I haven't done any studies, hardcore studies on it. You know, I've done some minor playing with this, so I haven't done any benchmarking or anything. But yeah, I definitely notice an improvement if I do it beforehand, not if I do it after. So just a little tip for you that I don't think a lot of people do that. The other thing about work sets is you start getting into them and looking. Sorry, I meant to stay in that work sets dialog box. That's not the work sets dialog box. Um, is something else that confuses a lot of people. And what you see set up in this file is I've got working views. Because not only do you have work sets for all of the modeled objects, every view is its own work set. So if I go in and start changing the scale of a view or the detail level from, from fine to medium or whatever, I now have parts of those objects borrowed. So if I come down here and say, ooh, let's change this to wireframe and let's go change the detail level to coarse, if I go back into my work sets dialog box and I say, let me see the views, now user 2 has borrowed certain properties of that view. So it's not just 3D modeled objects that become a work set. Project standards are a work set, as well as every single family is its own work set. So Revit's taking control over, gee, can I update this family in the project? If I load a new one in, no, you can't, because somebody else already owns that. So it's taking control of all of that information for you. Okay? And then the question did come up also as well. Um, why does it say non-editable after all of this down here? It says levels and grids, non-editable. Work set one, non-editable. What's going on here? Well, if you say editable, basically it means you've checked out that entire work set. It's kind of like what happened when we first created the file. And if you check out an entire work set, no one can touch any of those elements in that work set. So in this case, pretty much the entire building I just took control of. So unless you wanted to go work on the stairs and handrails and the stair towers, that's it. That's the only thing I don't own. So it's kind of one of those things I always like to tell people, pay attention to when you're getting in there, is don't, there's really no need to ever check out an entire work set. All right, so hopefully that answered the question that came up above. I think it did. Um... So last thing I want to talk about, because we have four minutes left, is what if I'm the project manager? If what if I just really want to go in here and start playing and doing some things in the, in the file? Or maybe I just did all this work in the file, drew that wall, changed the stairs, whatever I did, and I don't want to save it because I'm realizing uh, that probably wasn't the wisest thing. So if I want to get out of the file without saving, I can go hit close, and then Revit's going to pop up and say, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to synchronize? Do you want to save it to your C drive? Or do you want to not save at all? I want to definitely come in here in this case and say, don't save this project at all. But then the next dialog box comes up, and you want to make sure you give up your rights to all of those objects you touched. Otherwise, you're not saving, but you still own all of the walls, the doors, anything you may have touched. You still own that information. So if you're going to not save, you also have to say, give up my rights. Otherwise, you own the stuff you are playing with, and you're going to upset a lot of people on your team. Okay. So if I now realize I wanted to take this file and do whatever I want to do to it without affecting the central file, during the open process, what I want to do is check the detach from central. And what this is going to allow me to do is take a copy of this file, put it wherever I want, do a save as, move it onto my C drive, another folder on the server, wherever, and there's no relationship back to the central file. I think this is the biggest confusing thing for people, because so often I see people go into Windows Explorer, and copy the file from project folder A to project folder B, and they think they have a new central file. Well, if you guys saw it, I copied it from the server to my local machine, and it still understood there's a connection going back to the central file. So anytime you copy, move, or rename a file, it's still going to go back to the original file, understanding it's now a local copy, just not a central copy. So when you're getting into that and you're starting to think about it, make sure that if you need a completely broken apart copy, do an open with the detach from central button checked. Once I've done this, I'm now in a, a phase, a file, that has no relationship back to the original. So once I hit open, it's going to say, okay, you're detaching. Do you want to keep work sets? Or do you want to take it back to a single user file? More than likely, you're going to say keep work sets. Maybe you needed a single user file, but that's pretty, that's pretty rare. And now I have my own file, no relationship back to the project, 
And you'll also notice there's not even a name yet. This is kind of like a, a file that doesn't exist until I hit save. So now I can do whatever I want to do to this file, and I'm not going to have to worry about it going and breaking the central file, upsetting my entire team. Brian Adam asks, uh, I use work sharing monitor for Revit server style projects. I started using Blue Streak. Any options to using Blue Streak? Um, so what I didn't talk about when you're setting up Autodesk through your subscription, there's a there's a program you can download called um, Work Sharing for Revit 13, 14, whichever release they have one for each release. And what that is is if every team member in your project has that open, then as somebody's synchronizing, it'll tell you somebody's accessing the file on the server. So you can't access the file on the server. And really just try to keep in communication what's going on with that. If you're using Revit server, the work sharing monitor doesn't work over a WAN. So it's going to tell you what people in your local office are doing, but not what people in that Chicago office are doing. So that's where you need to bring in Blue Streak. Blue Streak brings a couple additional things to the table where it also has like, like it's like an instant messenger. You can talk back and forth. My biggest problem with Blue Streak is once you install it, I have not found a way to get rid of it without doing a registry hack. You can go uninstall the program, and then you hit save and rev it, and it'll still say, hey, I can't share access with Blue Streak, but I've uninstalled Blue Streak, but it'll tell you it's got to share the access with Blue Streak. So there are some issues with Blue Streak if once you install it, I have not found a way without registry hacks to uninstall it. So the simple uninstall doesn't work. But if you do want to have that communication um, over the web, for, for a wide area network, then Blue Streak is the way to go with that. All right, so it's uh, top of the hour. And Brian, do you have anything else? I think that was pretty much it. I just, if there's any questions, you guys can feel free to email us, talk to us about it. Um, there's my website, there's Stan, the CAD1 website. You can find my contact and Stan or somebody, probably info contact at CAD1 to yep. follow up. You can call me, that's fine, or, or one of our Mr. Juge or Mr. Calkins. Anyway, um, thank you very much. We will be doing a Revit radio. I don't know the date next month. I think it's around the 13th of February, um, somewhere we're in there. We're doing them the third Thursday of the month. Okay, that'd be about the 20th of February. No, sorry, the second Thursday. This one was the third Thursday because there were some scheduling conflicts last week. So oh, okay, Brian. Second Thursday of the month. Do you, do you know what your, uh, we usually do two webinars with you on that day. We have Revit Radio first, and uh, that'll be about the 13th. And then, do you know what the second topic you were going to cover that day You know, is? I don't remember what it is. I do know that Tony's going to be doing a webcast coming up on, what was it? It was, um, crap, I forget. Well, anyway, you'll get the you'll get the emails from us. Thank you for joining us today. Hope this was helpful. We'll have it posted on our uh, YouTube site, and you can check it out under CAD One Archives on the CAD One website and find a link to it there if you want to sit through it again. Otherwise, if you need some help, call either Mr. Mackey or CAD One. Thanks, Thanks everyone.